Hey everybody, I'm James from Wargames Illustrated and I'm here with Callum, also from Wargames Illustrated. Mm -hmm. And in between us is a rare treat, an unfinished but looking quite good Games Workshop figure. What's going on with this, Callum? It was a treat, let me tell you. So this is one of the new old squats. New squats. New squats, which are now referred to as the Leagues of Votan. Uh, so this one is Uthar the Destined. He's the leader of like the Thurian League, I think they're called. Uh, he's featured on the front of the Codex and he's beautiful and I wanted to paint him. So what I did for you today is a really nice, different kind of metallic effect for the Thorin League. Yeah. Uh, so we've got lots of different chipping, we've got some object source lighting on there, and some fun techniques to get some nice quick gold on there. So I think, I think there's a lot of uh, value for you here, hopefully. Yeah, I mean, Callum will go back into his box after this video. Oh well. But in that box, you do have a painting lamp, and yes. you've got your paint. So yeah. you'll, you'll go in the box and finish him off, yep. and then we'll show the finish figure, but yeah. for now, right yeah. now, we can show off how you got this far, right? Yes, absolutely we can. Leagues of Votan. I've got Uthar the Destined here, and as you can see, I have primed it black with Molotow Acrylic Black. In the airbrush, I'm mixing Dark Star Molten Steel with Airbrush Flow Improver. So in the cup, I put two parts of uh, steel with three parts of Airbrush Flow Improver. Then I also put two parts water in as well, just to keep it nice and thin. So as you can see here, I'm testing the consistency just on the palm of my hand so you can see it. I'm quite happy with how it's flowing. Uh, and so I'm just going to apply that all over this dark prime. So, as ever, have a wet or damp brush on hand because sometimes the needle will clog. Uh, and that it will just happen naturally. So you can see here, just giving it a quick wipe off and we're cracking on. We want to cover pretty much the entire armour for the model at this stage. Cleaning again. So we've got the nice metallic sheen on there, but it looks a little flat. So what I want to do is add some light values to it. I'm going to use Liquitex White Acrylic Ink first, and then I'm going to use Dark Star Molten Metal uh, Silver. We're going to use the white ink first because... Um, it's quite translucent, the metallics. So we want to establish uh, the brightness. So I'm just mixing some water, a little bit of flow improver, and the white ink into my cup. I mix just in the airbrush cup. There are some of the opinion that you should mix it before you put it in there, but I think it um, you can adapt on the fly if, you, if you're mixing it in there. Looks like I put two drops in there. And the good old airbrush flow improver. That was three drops. I hid it from the camera there. Mixed with a really ratty old brush because you can see the paint's going right up the top of the brush where you don't want it. Put some water in there, it looks a bit thick. So I'm just gently, I'm not trying to scrape the sides of the cup because you can scratch it. Those micro scratches will catch paint, so you just want to be gentle as you mix in like that. So I'm just going to create a little bit of backflow. I pinch the needle and you just pull the trigger back. Uh, what that does is it mixes it in the cup for you. So I'm testing here. I actually think that looks a little bit runny. So essentially I'm just adding some more white acrylic ink. because As I was testing it on the model there, the, the white was too thin. It was running a bit too much. And I don't want it to fall into the recesses really. I want to uh, spray from the top down as a traditional zenithal would, catching those top flat panels. So backflow fix that and then we're straight onto the model. You'll see here that we are focused from above. I went a bit too intense there. I'll just have to feather the trigger a bit more. But we are trying to catch all of those beautiful flat angles uh, from above. The model here, this Khan or Uthar, uh, the Destined, if you're building him as that, has lots of really nice flat panels. I mean, it's Games Workshop. So uh, we just want to catch all of those now with a Zenithal from above. Top of the kneecaps, there's an area that will catch some there, as you can see me pointing out. Uh, I'm doing the top of the boots as well, although they will end up being a different colour, but I was, uh, I was a bit enthusiastic at this stage. Already, you can see some really nice uh, well, light value difference between those bright sections and the dark steel uh, in the more recessed sections. So I'm actually really happy with that. I think we need just a bit more up the top.
So now we're going to put in Dark Star Molten Silver into our airbrush. And essentially capitalising on the uh, the opacity of that white ink. It's created all of our light values for us, so now we're just going to tint it metallic. So as, I, as before, straight into the cup. I try to get one or two squirts in here, not, not loads from the dropper bottle. Some more airbrush flow improver. And then a touch of water as well. It is, as you can see, uh, not very opaque. It's quite translucent, this paint. So you have to be careful. It's, th there's the temptation to thin it uh, quite a lot, but what will happen is you will lose control of it. And I, th I had to be careful when I'd mix this mixture up myself. It's a lovely colour, and it's beautifully bright. And when applying by brush, it's great, but I, th I found I thinned, I, it was easy to thin it too much by airbrush. So just be careful. Creating a backflow, as usual. You can see all that beautiful paint on my thumb there. So look, it's it's very thin. You can hardly even see it coming through on my hand there, which is this is why we've established it uh, with the acrylic ink. So again, we're testing on my palm. That's coming through a bit more opaque. So that's just what we want now. I want to be able to see what I'm doing. So pretty much from above, spraying top down, just trying to catch all that white uh, and make it white metal. Very simple, very quick. Just try to keep the angle consistent. That way uh, you won't end up spraying any of the steel and tinting that brighter than it needs to be. You can really see the definition on the knee uh, and the top of the uh, thigh as well. I think it's, it's a great example on there. Don't be afraid to move the model around if you have to, uh, to get that right angle. Obviously you can't turn your airbrush upside down because you'll pour all your paint out. So if you see the model go off camera slightly, that's what I'm doing. I'm having to shift around slightly. So there we go. So I am putting some of the silver dark metal molten metal on there. Uh, I'm applying this to my palette because what we're going to do now is we're going to pretty much edge highlight the model very you know selectively but we want to catch see as I'm showing here just on the belly all those kind of raised sections that really would grab your eye we don't, we don't want to do the whole model because the idea is we're trying to do a, a quick and effective uh, high quality painting video here so I've thinned it with a touch of water I'm getting most of it off as you can see like, <laughs> from all the paint on there I've been doing this for a while I do it on the thumb and then just carefully drag the side of your brush just along those sections like that this is, uh, Games Workshop models are great for this kind of thing. You get lots of nice, um, sharp, defined lines in that plastic. So you can just use the side of your brush for the most part, especially with these nice, highly pigmented metals. Uh, they're great for this job. So I'm just going to do it across all these sections now, where the airbrush hasn't quite given me as much opacity as I'd like. I'd like to enhance that effect. As you can see, I'm trying to block out all of the uh, the sharp edges at the start, all the ones that I can catch with the side of my brush, just because you get into a rhythm uh, of, of of doing it, and it's I find it much more. I find it flows much better, you know. There are some sections on the model that you uh, might struggle to get with the side of your brush. So as you can see here. You will just have to load your brush, uh, twist it so that it comes to a point. I do that on my thumb as well as I'm checking there's not too much paint on there. And just try and paint as a thin line as straight as you can. As you'll see, I'm bracing my hands against myself. So I've got the hand cradling the model, and then I've got my painting hand, my right hand, which is touching that as well. I'm creating a contact point, and that way I can steady myself and get those nice sharp lines. I am also uh, trying to create a bit of uh, visual interest on the model here. So for the sec center of these panels where I think light would catch, I'm also applying a thinner layer. Not quite a glaze consistency, but thinner than we've been highlighting with because I want to draw the light to that section. I've done it on the top of the knees, uh, I did it on the thighs earlier there, and I'm doing it on the belly as well. So we've got some beautifully clean armor here that is lovely and edge highlighted, but it looks too clean as, as I just said. We're going to add some wear and tear.
So we're going to weather this up using Citadel Rhinox Hide. This is one of my all-time favourite paints. I think on every model I paint I use this. So I'm going to put a little bit here on the palette. We're going to apply this by brush. So first what I'm doing is I'm thinning this right down with just water. And I'm going to run it into all the recessed sections. So all these rivets, I want to define them, more, more visual contrast. Uh, I'm also doing it in these underbelly sections here. Basically, I want to enhance the shadows. This will be more effective than just the steel because it doesn't have any metallic pigment in it. So you'll really notice the visual difference. Also some scratches, some scuffs. You don't have to be too intense here. Less is more, as is with every weathering uh, that you do. But specifically when you're using this tint, you will really notice the difference in finish. So don't go overboard. What I'm also doing at this stage is I'm also running it into all these recess sections because this is going to set us up for the gold that we will complete later. I'm also going to be using some of my patented technology, this uh, sponge. No, it's, everybody knows weathering is best with sponge. So I'm just dabbing up on my thumb. I've taken a little bit off the palette, but I'm checking to see how much is coming off first. Uh, you can use piece of paper, but I'm just using my thumb because why the heck not? And I'm just going to be applying some random texture all over the model. Um, again, because this is non-metallic, it really does show up nicely underneath the tint that we're going to apply. Less is more, but you do want some of this on there because it really enhances the final effect on the model. If you want to see a more detailed uh, version of how to apply this, uh, you can check out our Fallout Showcase, which features uh, a very in-depth section showing you just how to weather with a sponge. So as you can see, we've got that beautiful weathering on there. And honestly, you could leave it here if you wanted a silver effect, but we are going to take it even further. I'm going to go back to the silver molten metal in my palette again. The beauty of having a wet palette is your paint stays uh, hydrated for you whenever. And I'm just going to go cut back in for some of the sections that I think I went a bit too intense. Because as, as I say, you do really notice the Rhinox hide when you apply your tint because it is non-metallic. I'm also just going in any areas that I, I feel like having looked at the model should have another coat. So top of those flat panels really will be the brightest points on the model. So I'm just going in and uh, fixing those up now. Again... The more work you do at this stage, the less you do. Because for some of it, you can't go back. Once you've applied that tint, you can't really then start applying flat bits of metallics. So having looked at the model, we've got some really nice shine, but I don't think the effect is sold enough from the dark metallic to the bright metallic. Uh, it all almost looks a bit too flat. So we're going to add some paint, and we are also going to add some ink for some real intensity. Now, we're painting Uthar as he's shown on the box art. It's a blue-green uh, kind of Sons of Horus scheme. So I'm thinking a brown purple will contrast nicely. So I'm adding one drop of Liquitex Deep Violet Acrylic Ink, and I'm also popping in some more Citadel Rhinox Hide. You can't go wrong with Rhinox Hide. What will also be nice with this as well is because, again, it's not metallic, you will see there'll be a visual contrast between the finishes. You'll see the shine transition to a more muted matte finish. Uh, so I think that'll look really nice on the finished model. So I'm putting... One drop of that ink ink is very intense, and about one brushful of uh, Rhinox Hide. And the resulting mix, I'm thinning with a fair bit of water because, again, that ink is intense. And we don't want to go overboard here, we want to apply it subtly uh, in several layers. You can always add more, you cannot take it away. More flow improver because life's always better with flow improver. Well, life with an airbrush anyway. Mixing that with my old ratty brush. So, create that backflow. Get those bubbles. So as you can see, we've got a nice, really rich, uh, purpley colour. Looks a bit like Galvor back red, but much more intense. So what I'm doing is the opposite. So we're spraying from below. So I really like mixing inks and acrylic paints uh, together. 
you get the body and the, um, the kind of surface tension from the paint, but you get that really rich pigment from the ink. So again, got to clean the nib out every so often and also keep mixing the paint because as we're using two different uh, kind of bodies of paint, they will separate after so long. So just keep them mixed, create a backflow every so often. I'm catching all of the undersurface areas. Now I'm planning on doing a really cool object source lighting from below. Uh, and this will just enhance that effect, but also we'll have some really nice contrast. It's color theory. You mix your blue with a red, so we, instead of red we've shifted to purple. Uh, that brown Rhinox Hide has a lot of red in it as well, so it's just kind of mixing those colours that will contrast against each other, not too much, but um, will have that kind of visual contrast across the model. I'm also very carefully and very cleverly blocking it entirely from the camera. Uh, I'm spraying this on the, at the gut section, just into the recess in the middle of the armour, so we've got the, the highlight uh, that we applied and now I'm just adding a bit of contrast to it carefully feathering the airbrush here I'm using the 0.2 needle in my Harder and Steenbeck brush the 0.2 needle affords you so much control uh, especially with inks I'd really recommend it so what I'm going to do I'm take some of that out of the airbrush and I'm going to pop it onto my wet palette because I want to come back to it later so having it already mixed and ready to go um, is just handy I'm also going to use it now just to get into some of those recesses, like we did the Rhinox Hide, but this is a bit more intense, a bit darker, more saturated, so I'm going to be using it. I'm just using an old brush here, because the ink will really wreck all your nice new brushes. You can see already, it's splitting the hairs on that. So, synthetic brush, or an old brush that you don't care about anymore. So, what you'll see there is, I actually put too much on, and I removed it. Now, it's called spit blending, and I find it very useful. So it does what it says on the tin. Uh, you put too much paint on, you lick the rest off, and then you use your saliva to blend out the paint. Sounds disgusting, but trust me, it's it's very useful. So we've got really beautiful contrast in terms of actual colour contrast, but also in the different finishes. We have the really shiny from above, so the very completely matte, muted, or at least satin finish from below. Uh, so I think we're now prepared to add the tint. So now we need to add the tint to the armour to make it look like he's part of the Thurian uh, League. So I'm going to be mixing Achelian Green and Plague Bearer Flesh. These are both Citadel contrast paints. I'm going to be applying these in a 2 to 1 ratio, 2 Achelian Green or Achelian Green to 1 Plague Bearer Flesh. Again, my ratty old brush straight into the airbrush. We're mixing it in here. So I put two dollops of that into there. Try and get as much off of the brush as I can. I don't want to waste any of this paint because it's... It's like gold dust, isn't it? And then I've got my Plague Bearer Flesh. Both of these contrast paints, make sure you shake thoroughly. I sometimes bash them against my knee. Uh, I find that uh, the, be the best way to mix them. So as you can see here, we've got that really kind of sea green, uh, beautiful, uh, almost emerald with these, some of these colours. It's really a rich, vibrant colour. So two to one is the, the ratio that I found to be the most accurate to the box art while still having a metallic sheen. I'm also going to add in my trusty water and flow improver. Three drops. Mix with some water. So now we're just going to apply this uh, Citadel Contrast gradually all over the model. Uh, I was having a bit of pro a problem at the start getting it to come out the airbrush. <laughs> I had quite an intense splodge there, but as you'll see, I tested it on the cape itself because that's not going to be metallic when we're when we're finishing. So you want to apply this in several thin layers because again, you can always add more. You cannot take it off. So gradually apply this. Uh, I found short, sharp bursts with the airbrush uh, helped this to come out. I actually added a bit more water because it, it wasn't really flowing very well for me. Normally contrast paints are quite good through the airbrush, they're intense, but I was just having a bit of problem there. So here we go, sharp sharp burst from the airbrush just to carefully feather on that colour. If you're, like here, if you're stuck and it's not coming out, it's probably because your needle has clogged at the end, so just give it a quick wipe with a damp brush. So the beauty of having this metallic armour with the 
brown purple mix underneath is the the, the contrast color here will cover both but it will take to the metallic section more uh, give us that bright sheen be much brighter but it will also blend itself out because we've done the blending already so just apply evenly across the whole model I'm taking my time here because this step you can really mess a model up if you wanted a really subtle effect you could stop at this stage uh, but I want to in make it a bit more intense just cleaning off the needle here so I'm actually now taking my airbrush further away and giving short sharp bursts just to cover the entire model because uh, getting too close you can lose control and you'll get kind of a, a spider webbing where the paint's too thin and it runs so if you go further away at this stage, it doesn't matter if we cover uh, all the bits that don't want to be, because we're going to paint those later. So uh, my advice would be take the airbrush further back, cover the whole model. Make sure you cover both sections, the metallic and the non-metallic in this case, because you still want you don't want it to be purple brown. You want it to be purple brown tinted with our Thurian League mix. So I'm just going back in here because they're a bit too. Um, a bit too separated the two colours, I want to blend them together. So I'm doing that by applying a bit more of our Alkalian Green and Play Bear Flash Mix. Just applying to those purple and brown sections. So now you can see we've got this beautiful shine. As I'm turning it in the camera you can just see how the light is catching all of that, that metallic armour. And it's catching where we've directed it to, so the top of the knees, those edge highlights. And it looks fantastic, I'm really pleased with that. So I'm actually now going to start uh, adding some extra highlights to this model and really push the contrast. So I'm going to mix uh, our tint mix again, a Kelly and Green 2 to 1 with Plague Bearer Flesh. I'm also going to be mixing it in to the Dark Star Molten Silver. The reason I'm doing this is because silver would be just too, on, on its own, it would be far too stark and different. You can use it for the sharpest points and for any rivets and stuff, but for the general edge highlights you need to, to keep that tint in there. So I'm going to add these to my palette. All brush on there. So now normally you're not meant to put contrast paints on your nice brushes, however we're going to need a sharp point here um, and I'm willing to take the risk here. As long as I keep it not too far down the ferrule, we should be fine. So as you can see, I'm just basically going over the entire model, just catching those sections that I want to really illustrate as shiny. Where again, we're just tinting the metallic. Um, you could buy a metallic that was bright blue, you know, but why bother? Why We make it ourselves, so we're mixing it on our wet palette. Going ahead, as I said, catching all those rivets, all these uh, edges that really want to be nice and bright. So I'm actually just adding some slight chipping and weathering here, just because I think uh, I want to break up the model a bit more. We can see all the dark sections where we've got the Rhinox hide chipping on there, but we couldn't really see the brighter sections that we'd weathered in, so I'm just adding some of that now. Could do this by sponge, but I wanted a bit more control, so I lined it by brush. So you can see on here, we've got some really nice shine, contrast, and weathering. So on this panel here, on the shoulder, I thought it was a bit too flat, so I'm bringing some of the uh, the purple ink and rhinoxide mix that we'd saved earlier and I'm just kind of glazing that down towards the bottom of the panel. It's not necessarily how the light would you know, hit it but visually on this model it looks very nice. Just adds a bit of contrast to that section um, and it breaks up the armor because a lot of it is one color. Uh, I'm very pleased with that. Righty, so this section I'm just going in and dropping in Rhinoxide in any of the sections, such as on the shoulder pad, that I've missed from before. It doesn't really matter as long as you're neat and tidy at this stage, try not to get it onto the armour, keep it thin. If you do, as we said earlier, spit blend it out. 
So for the gold filigree sections, uh, we're running Rhinox Hide into those recesses for any sections that we may have missed before. I'm only human after all. I may have missed some sections, so we're just going in, thin down with water, just making sure we've got them all, because we need to have those sections blocked in uh, dark in the recesses for our next step. So I'm going in on the shoulder pad. I didn't realise this was actually a big, giant, dwarven face. Um, so we're going in, and basically you can see really nice and thin, just getting that into uh, all of the nice, lovely recess detail. Games Workshop now to do recess detail. They really do. So we're blocking that in. Is there anything else that I've missed? Uh, just reinforcing it, I think, on these shoulder pads here. Because, again, we want it to be almost completely opaque in those recessed sections. I'm also just going to do where the light will be as well. Because I want that to be dark to contrast against the bright light later. If you ever see the brush go off camera uh, and come back clean, I've licked it clean. I'm an animal. So now I'm going back to the Molten Metal Silver. I'm going to be taking this from my wet palette. It's almost, an, it's almost white. It's perfect. And I'm actually going to be catching now all of that filigree, basically cleaning it, cleaning it up so that it is white metallic. Uh, very carefully because we don't want to drop into the sections that we've that we just knocked down to brown. So going on, catching it all, this is how we're going to paint the gold filigree. This contrast basically does all the work forward here, the contrast between that silver and the brown. Uh, it makes our job much easier later. So now I'm just going to go ahead, use the side of my brush where I can, but if I can't, use the tip and just be very careful. This is why I'm using a fine tip brush here. So I'm now going to tint this armor just like we did with the blue, no, the blue green. We're now going to do it with a yellow gold. So I am taking some Citadel Contrast, Iandan Yellow, and I'm also grabbing a little bit of Flesh Terrors Red. But I only want a little bit of Flesh Terrors Red. Oh, so I went across there. Uh, <laughs> I made the mix a bit too dark, a bit too red. A little bit of a slip. So we're just going to bring a bit more of that Iandan Yellow back in. Onto the palette, mix it there. So I'm being quite firm here. I've got my old brush again, the one I don't really care about, because I'd... I Contrast paints tend to, if you really load the brush up, start to pull your bristles apart. So if you are doing something like this, using all the brush. So here you can see, we're just making sure the brush isn't too overloaded, but we're just applying it very thin, and it tints the armor to so that yellow. But because we've already got the metallic, it comes across as gold. It's fantastic. It's a really quick and easy method of getting a, a gold that looks lovely, but really took you no time at all. The only thing you have to watch out here is that you don't fall and you don't drop any of that yellow onto the blue because you will notice it slightly. If you do, you know, you could try and apply a bit of weathering to cover it up. That's what I do it later on when I make a bit of a mistake. I just do a bit of weathering, a bit of a highlight just to take that colour out of it. Any sections that you feel needed a bit more, apply a second coat. I actually went and got a synthetic brush for these bits because I <laughs> my other one was splaying too much. I didn't want I wanted maximum control. I didn't want to drop anywhere. There you go, just carefully dropping it in. So once that's dry, you can now come in and uh, add a highlight to it, essentially, just by applying that silver again, just to the tips. And again, it just reinforces, it almost makes it like a white gold. Uh, I think this this is a leader. He's leader of the Thurian League, so he should be suitably resplendent in golden armour. So we're doing nice shiny gold for him. Just be careful. Applying it, you just want just a little bit too much and you will make it look silver again. So you just really want to be minimal with this. There you go, would you look at that? In less than five minutes, you've got some really effective gold. And because it is more of a yellow, it contrasts really nicely against that blue-green we've already established. So, this model is really looking lovely. You can see some fantastic uh, gradient here. But we can take it further, and I really want to draw the eye. Uh, with some object source lighting. Now we're going to actually reference the codex, the front uh, piece of artwork on the front of the codex. So we're going to add that light to his chest because I think it'd be really nice spilling down and catching all that lipped section of his, his belly armor. So first of all, I am going for my trusty old white ink. This is uh, Vallejo Titanium White Acrylic Ink. Really great 
comes across, it comes out really fine. Um, you can thin it right down and you not lose control of it, especially with that 0.2 needle. So three drops of airbrush flow improver. I think I'm going to use three bits of water here. Let's see. That's still way too thick for for what we what we want here. So I was just basically refining the air pressure to make sure it's very controlled because if we slip here, it's really going to show. So be very careful. I would much rather, like me here, not apply anything at all and keep going at it for a few seconds but, you know, rather than splodging all over it. So first, I'm picking out the central, the light source itself, which is going to be the brightest white. So I was just trying to catch the big light section there, the circle of it, just cleaning off the end of the needle because it does clog with this, especially if I'm faffing about trying to be as controlled as I can. And then we're also going to draw the light downward. So we want it to hit the belly, the flat sections on the belly. I'm actually reversing my grip here because it was easier to hold. So firmly secured in hand, we're now just going to feather that across. You see, I did slip slightly, but it's okay because it was only very thin. So now instantly, we have a white light on there. Uh, and I'm just reinforcing it a little bit along the top there. So already, that looks great. I mean, if you wanted a white light, but we don't, we want to make it a nice yellow light. So we've, we've established our light values with that ink. We're now going to flip over. So we're now popping in Liquitex Cadmium Yellow, which is a very vivid yellow. It's, um, it's a cold yellow. I would say not not necessarily warm. Uh, it's got more of a green in it, so um, it's perfect for very you know artificial light. So we'll pop in into my airbrush, two drops of it, three drops of Flow Improver. Trust the old water on the brush, and we'll give it a good old mix in the cup. What we did with white acrylic ink before was establish the light values. Now again, just as we did with the armor, we're going to tint it now. So we're going to tint those light values with the airbrush. This is one of the key areas I think of speed painting is establishing your, your light values and then just tinting it. It's essentially what contrast paints do at their base level is that they just tint your bright white darker in the recesses, lighter on top. We're just being much more refined with how we want to apply it. So first of all, you can see my hand shaking here. It's very nerve wracking when you've you got to this stage on a model. I am blocking in the white, the, the yellow light. I'm starting with that because it's I can use it to to work out exactly. Working with an airbrush is very hard. You are, you are it's hand eye coordination. You imagine in a point that you're shooting at. So if you are nervous like me, uh, start with a section that you know you can hit. So that circle was a great value to you know to work out. Once I've done that. I've just then gone and tinted on the belly, and I've also had it just catch the top of that square belt buckle, just because the light would would gradually catch that. We don't want to. We're not trying to paint the yellow on there. We're just trying to tint the white, uh, and that's the beauty of it. So you can go slightly onto the blue as long as it's thin, because it won't really change the color too much. The white is what will be noticeable, although which is now yellow. So now we have one flat layer of yellow um, and even though it does still have values from that white it's not you know it doesn't look like light because you don't have the, the light source needs to be the brightest point there is and currently it's all flat and it's, it's all the same color so on my palette I'm now popping some of that white ink and some of that yellow ink on there and we're going to apply it carefully by brush now remember use a synthetic brush because inks really do wreck your brushes you don't want to use that nice Kalinsky sable brush and have have ink dry it out like the Sahara. So I've mixed white and yellow there in a one-to-one -one, and I'm just dabbing it because ink actually it blends very easily. So I'm just dabbing it onto that light source there and then I'm also taking a little bit off I'm going to have it catch because that edge would catch the most light there. Going on a little bit of the belt buckle here and it also would catch these rivets here because they are in the in the line of light value. Because they're shiny, they would also reflect the light far more. I'm also going to draw a sphere of light. It would catch the bottom of there. I think I need to push the brightness a bit further on that. I'm adding a little bit more white here. So I'm actually adding much more of the white ink into the mixture because again, the light needs to be the brightest source, otherwise it doesn't sell the effect. It's where most object source lighting goes wrong. <clears throat> And it's one of the great values of having this wet palette, being able to keep mixing these together. 
So we're adding in white ink in gradually increasing amounts and focusing it closer and closer to the central point of that light. As you can see here, I'm literally dabbing at just the center. But already you can see it looks far brighter than the entire, you know, the, the light being cast. I still think we can make it look a bit more reflective on the surface though. Um, a bit more transition of light. I'm just checking it under my light to see what I think. So yeah, I'm going to add a bit more yellow back in because that was, you know, obviously the brightest point of light. We don't want that. But we're going to go into the belly here and just towards the sphere of that light kind of block in where that light would be catching. So it will be there and it would also be the center of this little section here. And already you can just see that little touch sells the effect so much more. It, it's, it's crazy, isn't it? How much that changes how it looks. I'm now going for some pure white because I think the light needs to be a bit brighter compared to what it's casting. And there you go, look at that. You've got some fantastic contrast between that blue armor, the yellow white OSL. Um, I'm really pleased with that and I hope you found that very useful. So the cloak is essentially uh, Citadel Galvorback Red sprayed all over with the airbrush. I then blocked in the recesses uh, with Citadel Rhinox Hide just to really mute down those kind of recessed sections. And I highlighted it very quickly by mixing in some Citadel Pink Horror to block in those base values. Once I'd done that, I stippled a lot of texture in adding uh, Citadel Rakarth Flash very gradually. I didn't want this to be a key focal point of the model. I wanted to get it fairly quickly done. Still looking quite high quality, as has been the case with this model. But I wanted the focus to really be on the front of the model. So I actually had the face separate, as you'll see. I had it on a um, little piece of metal wire. And this was because it really allowed me to get the underneath zenithal uh, highlights and lowlights and the object source lighting. It allowed me to achieve that very quickly and easily. So a quick spray from below with Citadel Bugman's Glow. Then above with Army Painter Dorado Skin. I really like the Army Painter Skin sets. You'll see me use those a lot. I then quickly blocked in the eyes with some Rhinox Hide and Corax White for the pupil, mixed in with a little bit of Army Painter Dorado Skin because it's always useful to have some of your base skin mixed in the eye because white and black is way too visually contrasting. Then I applied some highlights, adding in some Citadel Amber Skin and then finally Citadel Corax White, those final uh, few spot highlights on there. Again, more of a quicker job with this because the real draw of the face is going to be that red glow from like the, the neckline. The hair was done by mixing Vallejo Sky Grey with some Citadel Baton Black and then just adding more and more of that grey in before finally adding Citadel Corax White for those final spot highlights. And the metallics are literally just scale 75 thrash metal with a bit of a wash. So as you'll see on the model here now, this next step, I'd got it pretty much finished but I had to start generating those light values so I painted the sword with just white ink. I just painted all the neck collar and also the weapon, the Volkite weapon, I painted all of the, the glow white as well. Just like we did with, just like we showed you with the yellow light, block in that light value, tint it afterwards. I also tinted the head, same way, I blocked in those light values using the white ink sprayed from below. It's very subtle, only slightly catching those sections, but it means it'll pop much more. And then as you'll see here, we sprayed from below with that red ink and also into the collar. For the Volkite weapon, I just mixed um, Vallejo Pyrol Red acrylic ink with that cadmium yellow that we used earlier, just to create an orange. And then for the in the coils, I mixed in some uh, of that titanium white ink, just dropped it in there. So I actually borrowed this from a Trevarian, fantastic painter. Uh, I highly recommend you go and check it out. It's on his Instagram page. It's one of his reels, and it's how to. Uh, paints basically molten metals. I'm adding something I use different colors because I didn't have any orange fluo uh, Ink or anything like that. I just use standard inks. I started with blocking out the sword with just the white ink as I said before Then I glazed on some of that cadmium yellow towards the top of the sword I then added in some of the pyrrole red ink to get kind of an orange color and honestly, I thinned it with a little bit with water, but we want to apply as much texture as we can, and the inks are really useful for that because they, they kind of pull together. And normally these kind of tide marks would wreck a model, but in this scenario, it actually really helped me out. So I applied that about two-thirds of the way up, focusing towards the edge of the sword. I then brought in some Citadel Mephiston Red, and then finally Citadel Corn Red, and this was applied in much the same way it was stippled 
uh, out towards the edge of the blade because we want it to look as if it's cooling as it hits the edges of the blade. The final step for this effect was then just applying Citadel Abaddon Black uh, along most of the edges of the blade but mostly towards the tip and along the central uh, line of the blade to sell that effect a bit really cooling. Uh, and then I thought the yellow ink on its own was a bit, as I said before, a bit too green in its hue. So I added some Citadel Corax White, dropped it down to the bottom of the blade, and I actually glazed on, it's my superpower for this model, I glazed on some of that contrast, I and yellow. And what that did is it warmed up that yellow tone and really kind of tied it all together. And you can see it really does look like a glowing molten blade. At that stage, the model is painted and all assembled now. Uh, for the backpack, I repeated exactly what I did on the uh, armor itself. It was, you know, yellow tint to the metallics, blue tint to the other bits, and then just a quick highlight with some silver. The base itself was, uh, the, the, the concept was a lava uh, illuminating the, the lower half of the model. So I basically green stuffed on some bubbles, bit of texture, but I tried to keep most of the base very simple because we wanted this to be nice and quick. I primed it with uh, one for all Molotow acrylic black, as usual. I then sprayed on some Citadel corn red into the recessed areas and up across the, the rocks. It's, it's key that you've painted the rocks fully at this stage. I then applied the Liquitex Pyrol red acrylic ink, very bright, punchy. I basically just added more and more yellow uh, and I also stippled on some of the orange to try and create a fire texture. However, it didn't have enough vibrancy at this stage. It, it was looking too desaturated, especially compared to all the inks that were used on the Molten Sword. So I went back in uh, and punched up the intensity with those inks, adding more and more of the yellow towards the bubbling sections, trying to create some kind of flows with the orange, just to really kind of liven up the model. While I was doing that, I also sprayed the model from beneath very selectively, trying to catch the armor panels particularly, but also a bit of the cloth. Once I'd done that, the armor panels, because they are shiny, would reflect the fire the most. So I actually used Citadel Fire Dragon Bright and kind of glazed this on as, as kind of an edge highlight towards the bottom of the panels, as you'll see on here. So we've got some really fantastic contrast between the bright blue, the almost silver at the top, the standard blue, we've got the purple brown that we brought in, then the orange red of the fire, and then the pure orange of the edge highlight, all across that flat little panel there. Fantastic. Very quick and easy, but also adds so much pop to this model. And I'm so pleased with the finished result, as you'll see it spinning here. There is so much going on with this model, but I don't think any one piece distracts you too much. This video has been brought to you by WI Prime, Wargames Illustrated Magazine's online members club. View more videos or find out more about WI Prime by following these links.